Welcome back everyone to another video. This video has been a long time coming and a highly requested video from my viewers covering the PS Vita and its GPU, which launched on December 17th, 2011 in Japan and reached North American and European shores on February 22nd, 2012. For its time, it was a remarkably powerful handheld system designed to deliver console-like experiences in a portable form factor. I've definitely been wanting to cover this one and as we continue this series of console GPU breakdowns, and happy to break down the Kermit SoC that housed the PS Vita's GPU, the Power VR SGX 543 MP4 Plus. God, they just had to make that as monotonous as possible to say. But before we begin, if you are new to the channel and enjoy tech breakdown videos and other tech videos in general, consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads. And if you enjoy this video, make sure to smash the like button. That way YouTube will share this video to others who may enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all your support. Now let's just get right into the rest of the meat here. Now the main components responsible for gaming, the CPU, the GPU, and the RAM, were all packaged together inside of the Kermit SoC, a chip that contains multiple components on one die and was made by Toshiba in partnership with Sony. The Kermit SoC was a stacked chip SoC fabrication model, or SCS. This fabrication allowed circuitry to be stacked on top of others instead of having to be externally connected, which provided higher efficiency and more bandwidth all with a lower size profile. Due to this construction, the Kermit SoC impressively housed the powerful specs the PS Vita had for its time as a handheld console. And for a rundown, starting with the CPU, it had a Cortex A9 MP core chip, which was a 32-bit RISC instruction set processor that had four cores where the clock speed of the cores could dynamically be scaled depending on load. In many games, the CPU ran between 200 and 400 megahertz due to the scaling nature of the CPU to conserve power where it can, although it was capable of reaching up to 500 megahertz at full speed. The GPU was the aforementioned, here we go again, Power VR SGX 543 MP4 Plus, and we're going to dive into that later, of course, as it's the main focus of this video. But what's also impressive is the Kermit's SoC also houses the console's total 640 megabytes of mixed LP DDR2 SD RAM and CD RAM, the former used for the CPU and operating system, and the latter for dedicated video memory for the GPU. But we will also touch up on all of that later. And this was all packed into a mobile device that had a 5 inch OLED screen on the original model or an LCD in the later slim variant with a resolution of 960 by 544 pixels and a 32-bit color depth. Empowering the graphics on that screen was the star of the show, the PS Vita's Power VR GPU, which was a quad-core mobile GPU from Imagination Technologies Series 5XT family. Clocked at a base frequency of 222 megahertz, each of the GPU's four cores housed two arithmetic logic units for a total of eight shader pipelines. These pipelines were part of a unified shader architecture, meaning the same cores handled both vertex and fragment processing dynamically. The PS Vita's GPU also featured two texture mapping units per core for a total of eight as well for efficient texture sampling and filtering. At its base 200 megahertz, the GPU delivered a theoretical 28 gigaflops of floating point operations performance and could push out up to 133 million polygons per second, though real world performance often fell short due to memory bandwidths. The estimated pixel fill rate landed in at around four gigapixels per second and had a texture fill rate of about eight gigatexels per second. Now, if you're familiar with GPU architectures, you may be questioning the four cores I just mentioned, or it just may sound very unfamiliar with GPU tech speak in general. But this was no mistake on my end. You see, the PS Vita actually used a different approach to graphics processing naturally by going with the Power VR GPU. You see, internally, what truly set the Vita's GPU apart was how it handled workloads. While modern GPUs, including mobile ones, rely on massive arrays like SIMD cores or SIMD cores, where hundreds or thousands of units perform the same instruction across different data, the Vita's PowerVR GPU used a much more CPU-like approach. Each core was a USSE2 unit, a multi-threaded vector processor capable of independent instruction flow, branching, and dynamic control. In short, these were fully programmable cores that were more akin to mini CPUs rather than typical shader ALUs found in most GPUs. This architecture offered a high degree of flexibility instead of being forced into parallel lanes. Each USSE2 core in the GPU could handle a diverse set of shader threads. They could adjust dynamically based on workload and even perform control-heavy logic that would normally stall conventional SIMD pipelines. Developers could target more complex shaders and effects, but this also meant that they had to think more 
more like CPU programmers, carefully managing thread balance and instruction flows across the cores, increasing the difficulty of development and optimization as a result, but like I mentioned, it certainly had advantages when properly used. To handle rendering, the GPU used Tile-Based Deferred Rendering, or TBDR. This technique divides the screen into tiles and processes each tile independently. By rendering only the visible pixel within each tile and calling the geometry early, TBDR drastically reduces overdraw and optimizes memory usage, which is a particularly useful thing in a mobile gaming device that has limited capabilities by nature. Beyond its core rendering architecture, the PS Vita's PowerVR GPU also supported 2x multi-sample anti-aliasing, although whether or not MSAA was enabled was up to individual developers. Sony's customizations to the SGX 543 MP4 Plus also included the addition of a tuned rendering pipeline, which gave the Vita superior texture performance alongside its dedicated VRAM when compared to other devices that use the same GPU family, such as the iPad 2 back at that time. And speaking of RAM, let's dive into the configuration of the memory that the Vita used. I mentioned earlier that it had a total of 640 megabytes of RAM with a mixed type. 512 megabytes of RAM was LPDDR2 SD RAM or single data rate memory, 256 megabytes of which were dedicated to games and the other 256 megabytes dedicated to the operating system. Although a later firmware update allowed 30% more RAM from the OS to be used for gaming. The main system memory was 64 bit and provided a 5.6 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. 128 megabytes of RAM was the CD RAM or custom DRAM. The name reflects the lack of double data rate memory like the main system configuration, but is used to separate its name from the main system's SD RAM, but it is likewise single data rate as the system RAM. And when you take all this hardware together and games were properly optimized for it, the results were impressive. Games like Uncharted Golden Abyss demonstrated advanced shader usage for lighting and normal mapping, while Killzone Mercenary delivered real-time shadows, post-processing, and dense visual detail. These two games are just a few of many games that showcase the synergy between CPU and GPU and what such a large increase in RAM over its predecessor could do with this new generation of mobile gaming when developers had the time and resources as well as skill to tailor their engines to the systems and hardware strengths. In fact, for comparison, its predecessor, the PSP, the Vita was just in a different league altogether. Even against the Nintendo 3DS, the Vita had a significant performance edge over its competitor for its time. The 3DS used a Pika 200 GPU that I covered in this video here and had 4.8 gigaflops of floating port performance capable of 15.3 million polygons per second, 800 million pixels per second, and had a dual core ARM 11 CPU offering around 1 billion instructions per second, about a third of what the Vita's CPU was capable of. In the end, the PlayStation Vita's hardware was a bold blend of mobile efficiency and console ambition. Its quad core CPU capable of clock scaling and its power VR GPU with programmable vector cores and overall architecture made it a technically impressive device. Developers who understood the system were able to unlock the console grade visuals in a handheld format and makes me hopeful that maybe Sony gets back in the mobile space and with rumors of a next generation PlayStation Portable possibly coming out in the future, I can't help but just be a little bit excited. But I want to know what you guys think about the GPU inside of the PlayStation Vita and I want to know if you have any favorite memories of your time with the PS Vita. Let me know down in the comments below and also let me know if you watch the whole video so I can personally thank you for being a top supporter, which I consider anybody who sits through and listens to me ramble this long. Anyway, that's all I have for you in today's video, and I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. Peace.